Welcome to episode 275 of the Overlook Hour. I'm your host, Clark Little. Along with me, as always, is the man over in Atlanta, Georgia. I see him right now. He's in his new one-bedroom apartment with... Randy, what are we calling that cabinetry? What color, what sort of pattern is, is your cabinetry situation? I don't know. It's a wood situation. I'm not exactly sure how to describe the uh, the color of it. It's kind of like a, it's a lighter, like a hardwoods looking thing. It's kind of like grayish almost. <laughs> <laughs> that voice you hear is Randy Michael Statt. And here to help us uh, solving his wood dilemma is Russell John, the fisherman. Yeah, okay, so I guess we're still introducing the engineer over the other host. Uh, thanks, Clark, you did. I told you, this is how it goes. This is, you can't come in here, this is precedent. This is how I've introduced the show <laughs> for many, nah. many shows. It's time to evolve. We're, we're moving forward. Also, Randy, it is very Ikea-looking, like, fake wood paneling back there, which I'm oh, a yeah. I'm sure it's not real wood. I like it, though. I don't. I well, think you your can't, apartment. You can't tell if it's real wood, dude. Uh, I don't know. I haven't done much woodwork in my life. He's never had any real can, wood, dude. <laughs> yeah, I I've been trying to Just solve my wood problem for years. <laughs> That's the first place you go to is a butt. Yeah, butt's funnier than pussy. Pussy makes people go. Whoa. All right. <laughs> butt's like that's yeah, butt. At least half the show. Plus, butt is. Uh, you know, that goes for every human, except, you know, those who don't have buttholes. So our brothers and sisters with Crohn's disease. All right. Which is terrible. Just don't let that butt joke linger. <laughs> uh, I did not have a good travel day, guys. I did Wait, not have okay, a good are you going to complete the intros? You always start us here. Wrong. Okay, <laughs> yeah, okay, go Hi. <laughs> Okay, your mic's going back off. Now, it, it's very hot over here, so we have a bunch of fans, like, directly on us. Again, touch me if you want to say anything. I know you got mad at me at the interview. But yeah, because I was, and then you looked at me like, what? <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, uh, it's very hot here today. And it's my own fault that we're recording late, but whatever. Oksana just told me it was 75. That's not very hot. Yeah, but I also said that in this room it feels 85. Oh, believe me, I know. What's what's the temperature? What's the uh, gauge say outside the room? No one's probably like I'm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's probably like eighty. I don't know. It's it's fucking hot. If it's eighty, it's warm for sure. All well, right, it's a hundred. Well, it's hundred and ten down here. Well, Randy, are you gonna are you gonna share with our listeners your um, clandestine meeting with your adopted parents? Sure. Yeah, I met our. Hold on. Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Slow the fuck down. Did you not see? I set this up where I start the goddamn show. I know. You don't run the thing. You're watching a goddamn football game. I don't know when you're going to be in or out. So I'm going in and out. No, that's why I took my glasses off because you, you got me. I, yeah, I could see the whole game reflected in your lenses. Oh, no. Lens, I got two big lenses. <laughs> and you, got, again, you have to turn your whole head when you're watching the TV. So now that the glasses are off, it doesn't matter. Also, the wood paneling on your bed behind you, I can see the TV reflection, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, th you can't get away from this one. Look, I watch two. I only get to see two Saints games a year. Right. It's the first day of the season. What do you want? Podcasting is all about multitasking, dude. Come on. I, I Yes, I'm the one behind three monitors with the mixer right now. I, I get it. Dude, I don't know. I've, I've got to stop with this, like, um, doing multiple things at one time. I'm about to tell you an embarrassing thing I did yesterday. Were you in so, the bathroom? Uh, no. Okay. Oh, my God. Touchdown, Saints, baby. All right, look, here's what happened. <laughs> yesterday, I was doing college football. So we play at 4 o'clock. All the games are on ESPN through the ESPN3 application. So I get the extra TV that we have. I put that TV on the floor. I hook my Apple TV to that TV so I can broadcast the game on the TV. I'm listening to the radio call in my headphones, and I'm playing Xbox. 
Are I was doing to, all three of those things. Trying to turn into Mickey. I know. Mickey, come or at me. Mickey from the Three Friends podcast. You really got to give some context with that. <laughs> People might think Clark's going to turn into a mouse. Oh. Okay. Welcome yeah. back. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's what they're going to think. You know, from now on, I'm just going to let those pauses hang when you're staring at the TV and you forget we're recording. I wasn't staring at the TV. You were looking. Randy, back me up on that. I think there, I, I actually don't know. I don't know if I was paying attention either. <laughs> There you go. That's a vote for me. God damn it. <laughs> oh, but yeah. <laughs> no, Russell, you got no commentary on this? I was watching the game, listening to the radio broadcast of the game in my headphones, and then playing Xbox. Yeah. That's what you do with everything. You I know, walk I around the it. house with headphones in. You sit down to watch a movie, but take out your phone immediately. Everything <laughs> is two screens. I know. I got to stop it. Yeah. Remember that rule you made where you're like, I'm not bringing my phone in when we're recording. I don't. I mostly don't. Well, you know, another TV or a computer streaming a football game is kind of the same idea. To a degree. Okay. <laughs> so hey, I, I'm doing what I had to do. We had, you told me you wanted to go today. So we're going today. Like, okay. Concessions have to be made. <laughs> Okay, well, what were you going to talk about that Randy's uh, clandestine meeting with his new adoptive parents had to wait for? Well, I was just setting it up for my tra- tra- travel, ter- oh, <laughs> my terrible travel day. Oh, but since was- you got your, but since you got your own narrative, nah, I j- I had nothing go on this week. Just scheduling a lot of boring stuff that you know isn't worth talking about. You, no, I just actually- lost. I left my hat in the airport, dude. How? Because I was sweating because you have to walk three miles in the Harvey Milk Terminal. (laughs) And I sit down. I had just purchased a bottle of Perrier and was having a nice refreshing refreshment. (laughs) (laughs) And I put my hat, I take my hat off and I put it in the chair behind me and I never picked it back up. Dude, you don't put your shit on another chair. You got to like put it on your lap or like hook it on a finger or something. I know. A finger. Yeah. God. (laughs) What is that? Are you referencing the movie that you walked out of last night? Okay. You want to talk about that? We can briefly talk about it in the beginning. I'm not going to like try and review it or anything. I don't know. I gave it 15 minutes. It, it, It really wasn't so much the movie. It was just, I get antsy and I was just too antsy to focus on anything. Yeah, because I, cool. I honestly, but because I was worried about today, because I knew today was going to be a bad day, and I was correct. I feel like it's a self fulfilling prophecy with you, though. No, they put me on the fourth floor. You know, you know, whenever people are like oh, scabs, <laughs> scabs stay on the fourth floor, dude. Okay. <laughs> I'm an executive. I thought higher was supposed to be better. It is. They, I've been on the seventh floor for seven, eight weeks straight. And this week they fucking want to put me on the fourth floor? Okay. I'm going to take a shit in the hallway. It's like that terrible movie I watched at the Castro where it was that social divide. High rise. Yeah, fucking hate that movie. I never saw it. You know, one of the things that I I started uh, trying to add to my own life was I wanted to discard that whole, oh, it's going to be a bad day. You know how like when you trip or something and then you you find a penny on tails or some shit and people are like, oh, it's going to be a bad day. I always found that to just be an issue of perspective. Like if you start looking at it as a bad day, that's all you're going to see. Well, yes, I agree. If you go looking for trouble, you will find it. Yeah, I agree. And that's all you look for. No, no. You know what I look for? I look for the truth. (laughs) And I've been down here for, this is my, I, I don't know. I think 14th week, 15th week. I've lost track. And did you find any truth out there? I, it's my life is Groundhog Day, dude. I know how everything is going to work down here. All right. When are you gonna I, I just I knew it in my bones that I was going to get, you know, Shanghai. Can I get can I say that? Anymore? You're going to get addicted know. to I don't, even, I don't even know. I don't even know what Shanghai means. I think like, I don't know, kidnap. Is that what it means? I don't know. Oh, I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might get kidnapped later today. 
Oh, but, God, no. That's the last thing I want. Wait, so your terrible trip, the only thing that happened was you lost your hat? Russell, I've had this hat for a decade. It's a nylon cap. Oh, it, that, that, you know, the blue one? Yeah, with the arrowhead on it. Yeah, I hate that hat. What are you talking about? It's my favorite hat. I it, Yeah, by your favorite, it means that you leave it everywhere. And it's Well, just, guess what? It's not going to be a problem anymore. <laughs> No, it kind of fixed itself in that regard, I guess. Anyway, you you have better hats, dude. I'm not going to mourn that one. I'm 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 kind of upset about it. All right, well, Clark, you had a you had a bad trip, but Randy got to meet his new parents, and I'm dying to hear about that. <laughs> yeah, Friday night I went to a uh, a venue called Five Two Nine here in East Atlanta. What does that mean? Couple- Is that zip code? I was the address of the uh, Area code. Uh, the the location. Oh, five two nine, and I Next. don't remember what the street name is. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I met um, our friends, the cellar dwellers, Christian and Colby. Colby's girlfriend was there as well. Met her. They were all very nice, and uh, yeah, it was cool to meet them and see uh, Christian's band play. They were they were solid. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Well, we didn't chat a whole lot. Um, and then both Colby and I, up. towards the end, yeah, or uh, kind of like waiting to like say bye to Christian. And then Colby's like, I'm actually a uh, big fan of the Irish goodbye. I was like, cool, me too. Because he looked busy just talking to people that, you know, he knew from the show and stuff like that. Um, so I didn't say bye to him, but I'm sure we'll see each other soon. I think we're going to go try to see the card counter sometime this week. Oh, look Hell at that. Yeah. You traded in Clark already. You've already got some new card counter buddies. America is card counter buddies. <laughs> I'm not going to watch it, so whatever. But why? I don't, I don't what, what I don't want to watch a movie any movie that has like playing cards in the title, I'm out. You know what I hate? Playing cards. Unless you're a magician, then I'll watch you like make them disappear or something, but what if okay. the card counter has Catholic guilt in the movie? Uh, maybe. You know what? I'm going to shuffle right. cards you while we go talk see it. about it. Yeah. You know what? Clark pulled out a deck of cards because this is how hacky it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably yeah, but- going to be loud. Maybe not that loud. No, it won't because he doesn't know how to use that mic yet. What are you talking about? I think you're still talking into it wrong. Incorrect. I fixed that. Did you? Okay. Well, he just moved it away. That is eh, that's pretty loud. I'll get that drop of the card shuffle. <laughs> All right. Well, Randy, how's Atlanta? Like, how how's the Plaza Theater? Uh, I haven't been since I was here uh, just visiting in 2019, but um, it was oh. cool. Uh, oh. I'll probably, I think they're showing, I forget what the movie's called, but um, it's like a sort of a faux doc um, with St. Vincent, the musician. Oh. In Carrie Brown's scene, I think it opens on Friday, so I'll probably go there for that, if not earlier to go see Candyman, which I still have not seen. Uh, it's Brownstein, dude. Is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know. Could have been. Um, but yeah, I did go to a different theater this week to see something that I'll talk about later. Oh, Kevin. you know what? How did we get away from fingers without actually even mentioning or talking about it at all? Because we started talking about my neuroses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I feel like we should at least a little bit now. Uh, how did we watch that movie? It was on Shudder, right? I don't know. What do, you, what do you think about it, Clark? I got nothing. I watched 15 minutes. All right. Well, fingers. You got, you, all right. All right here's, here's one. You know when I left the movie? When you pointed out something to me that infuriated me. Oh, no. Was, where? All right. So the... I think the main reason why you watch this is because you're like, oh, is that the dude from Greasy Strangler? Yeah. Now, both you and I, and I'm going to assume Oksana, is not a fan of the Greasy Strangler. Now, let me be clear. I like that director. I like his follow-up film. And I, there, are, there are parts of the Greasy Strangler which I do appreciate. The score is definitely one of those. Yeah. But overall, I just think the tone, I don't, I just, it, it's not, it's not my favorite. Uh, An Evening with Beverly Luff Lynn, 
that's more my speed. I like that one more. Um, and I appreciate what he's doing. Um, it, he's an interesting voice. Uh, Jim Hickle, is that his name? Who? I can't think of it. The director of the Greasy Strangler. Oh, I don't know. Um, Jim Hoskin. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but anyway, um, so that Michael St. Michael's, I think is the actor's name that shows up in fingers. And you pointed out that when we first see him, Randy, prepare thyself. He is Uh wearing a, he is wearing a pin of himself on his jacket. Yeah. (laughs) Which, okay, you know what? Let's do this right. I'm going to be quick though. So fingers came out in 2019 uh, Amanda has an issue with other people's physical imperfections. Hell breaks loose when Walter, a coworker of hers, shows up to work with a pinky missing from his hand. Um, the the lady who plays Amanda, um, Sabrina Friedman Seats, she's great. And when the film was about her and her weird, her weird completely judgmental perspective of you know they do a great job where she goes to buy donuts for her work and the lady who um the young girl who loads up the uh dozen for her has a birthmark on upper, on her upper arm and our lead is so grossed out by it that she throws away the dozen immediately and yeah. it's a perfect introduction yeah. we follow her to work and there's this great <laughs> Like we know what the movie is and the poster is called fingers. And w- right when she gets to work, we have a close up of a dude typing and he's missing a pinky and it's not like gone. Like he was born without it or it was amputated. It's like a rough, uh, s- severance there. Like it looks- and there's no, there's no bandaging. It's like, a, it's a gaping wound on yeah. his hand. It looks like a dog ripped it off and then he just came to work. And then, you know, we smile. The next cut is a medium shot of him happily typing. And me and Clark started dying. Dude, it was great. (laughs) And she's revolted and she's his boss. And she tells him, like, she won't even look at him or get in the same room. And they have an intern who comes in and, like, what do you want me to do? And she's like, get him the hell out of here. And the movie's kind of her meeting with a uh, cult of personality therapist. And it's kind of quirky and interesting and there's like, it comes out that she's like, (laughs) I don't know what she was doing, but she had an interaction with a short uh, black man who uh, she became revolted by. And you know, it 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 was Beetlejuice dude, an equivalent. (laughs) And uh, it was more like Gary Coleman when he was a security guard. And She just, she said like she hated uh, dark skin. She's like, oh, the darker, the worse and the smaller, the worst. And she's become this like vile person. But then the movie's about her learning redemption and getting over it. And then, you know, something happens halfway through and the perspective shifts to the, to the people that took the finger from that dude. And the tone of the movie, it felt like it moved out of like scripted avant-garde territory to like, improv comedy and when that dude got behind the wheel man it the tonal shift just lost me and as the movie continued we get a lot more of that and by the end i was just ready for it to be done but like man i really wish we just stuck with the female perspective and uh i think you left like right when that turn started like rearing its ugly head clark so this is what i tend to do I think you left and it got like better instantly, which is, you know, the bit where every time you leave the room, the movie always picks up and then it it dipped. It was like watching fucking cryptocurrency. It it spiked and then it plummeted. It was (laughs) topical. That's for all my crypto heads out there. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that's all we need to say about it. Um, Again, then we went on Letterboxd and a lot of our friends really liked this movie. So again, send your angry emails to the Overlook Theater at gmail.com or just go ahead and DM me on Instagram. I'll take it. And uh, yeah, I don't know. You all got any other st- Oksana, anything you want to talk about you did this week? <laughs> I feel like we should give you a, a platform. No, I don't. You sure? We need some women perspective. Anything? <laughs> and that's why she doesn't have a platform. I know. <laughs> Okay, just so so all the people who say I'm really mean to her, just know I love her. I gave her a platform. She didn't want it. She said, fuck you. She's flipping me off right now. So 
<laughs> okay. Is regularly in Russian. In Russian. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are, are we ready to move the show on? Uh, yep. Yeah, bring him in. All right. All right. Come on in. Good morning. It's September 12, 2021, and it's a Sunday. Well, we keep working and enjoying our weekend projects. And the word for the day is light bulb. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> oh, no. Have a great day. <laughs> what are you talking about? Good morning. Oh, he started over. No, okay. Now he left. He, I think he's on something. They must have switched up his medication. I just, light bulb. I, I again, I, he does the weather report from LA. I only slightly edit that. I don't know what the fuck he was talking about with the word of the day being light bulb. Light bulb, because I have an idea. <laughs> that idea is I have dementia. <laughs> Everyone, have a great day. Again, the director of Firewalks with me, and uh, what's what's your favorite David Lynch movie, Oksana? <laughs> the Straight like Story? like Blue Velvet. Okay, and Blue Velvet. There we go. Hack. Yeah, hack choice, but that's what you get when you ask a woman. Wild at heart, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's Wizard right. of Oz. All right, Randy, I tried to throw you a, a Hail Mary at the end of the day to get you to watch a film with me. You didn't. So, all right, explain your 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 title that I can't remember that confused me in our pre-meeting. Oh, wait, now, before, I'm sorry, before we do that, I have one more thing. Um, uh -oh. yesterday, yeah. uh, yesterday, of course, was uh, September 11th, uh, oh, the, 20th, the 20th anniversary thereof. Uh, so, Randy, uh, did you ha do anything special? Did you have your annual Jenga tournament? <laughs> yeah I, I actually uh took my jenga set to uh sweetwater creek and went on a hike and then i played jenga by the uh by the creek by myself why do i believe you <laughs> wait you you Good cut improv, that off baby you you oh. just wanted to get a last minute shot in at randy <laughs> randy idolizes new york there's no way he would ever play jenga on 9-11 i'm not taking a shot at randy i'm taking a shot at this nation okay <laughs> Didn't and you? One, I, I saw you do stand up one time in the, yeah. the the long time we've known each other. I believe you had a nine eleven joke in there. Did you, you only see me do? You only see me do stand up one? No, you saw me do stand up. Oh, maybe two times. Yeah, no, two no, times, twice, it, three. Well, one time you missed. No, okay, that would be four. I've seen you do it three times actually. Twice at the uh, Purple Onion, and one time uh, with Sketchfest. Twice at the Purple Onion. Yeah. I saw you one time that you didn't, like, promote widely. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And then... I mean, the that, was e time, that was every time. Well, <laughs> no, one time you did a little bit. You had a poster. I always had posters. Okay, well, then, look, that's... Because I didn't... Because I didn't... I did, I, no, no, no. Let me be clear. I did not do the posters. Oh, okay. Who, there you go. Which family member was doing it for you? Bro, no, I had a team. You understand? Oh, no. You had, like, an intern? Yeah, dude. What's her name? Did they ever find the body? I, was... <laughs> I don't know. It's going to go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Back to you, Randy. All right. Yeah. So the movie that uh, I, I talked about earlier that you couldn't pronounce is called Mogul Mowgli, uh, starring Jungle Riz Book? Ahmed. <clears throat> Almost. Um, directed by Bassam Tariq. It just came out uh, this year. I think it played some festivals maybe in the last year or so. Uh, I was really looking forward to this, so I saw it at the Midtown Art Cinema Thursday night at like 7 because it wasn't playing anywhere after that, or at least not for now. I couldn't find any showtimes in the area besides um, that one. Um, basically, this movie is about um, Riz Ahmed's character named Zed. Uh, he plays a young British rapper who's kind of uh, on, like, the very verge of success, like, about to, like, kind of break big. He's also, um, he's Pakistani-British, which is what Riz Ahmed also is. Um, he was a co-writer on the movie, I think, along with the director. Um, so it feels like it's uh, pretty, like, personal, and there's probably, like, a lot of cultural stuff um, in it that maybe I didn't get. Um, 
but yeah, it's a, uh, it's pretty good. It starts off with a scene of him kind of like at a show and you can tell kind of like, um, what his like lyrical style is like and how it like really relates to like, uh, his family and like where he's from and sort of just the, like the, uh, you know, the British Pakistani like perspective and stuff. And it's, uh, I know it's got a lot of like really cool lyrics and I think it actually comes from some of his rap lyrics. Cause Riz Ahmed also, yeah, does music stuff like, um, on the side of acting as well. Um, but yeah, the, the movie, um, from actually after that first scene, he goes back to see his family that he hasn't seen in like two years. And you could tell there's a little bit of like weirdness around like him and his family. That's like more kind of traditional. And they kind of make fun of him for uh, his name, Zed, that he goes by uh, in America, because that's not like what his actual name is. Um, so they're kind of like ribbing him a little bit about that and how he's kind of like, I don't know, kind of like going away from like his like culture and stuff like that. Um, but also around the same time, he develops like this autoimmune disease where essentially like his limbs like start to like not function. Um, so a lot of the movie is spent with him like in the hospital. Um, so yeah, this kind of sounds similar to, um, sound of metal in the sense that he's like, yeah, the hell I know it's crazy. (laughs) Um, this is very different movie though. It's, uh, from there it becomes very kind of like dreamy and surreal. Um, it kind of reminded me, I don't think any of you guys saw it, but I talked about it on here. Um, this is much darker, but it kind of reminded me of some of the like imagery of the lost okoroshi um like i said there's a lot of stuff in here that seems like it's probably like very cultural and like stuff that maybe went over my head um but i don't know it's pretty cool it's kind of experimental yeah it has a lot it feels yeah it feels personal it feels like it has a lot to do um with kind of just his character and kind of like what he's dealing with like you know between um being in america and kind of the stuff with his family, then also like having to deal with this new medical condition, uh, which probably will not enable him to be able to, uh, do what he loves. So, um, yeah, Riz Ahmed, uh, I feel is like one of our, especially after sound of metal, I think he's like one of our, our best actors at the moment. So this is, uh, this is really good. If you're a big fan of Riz Ahmed, um, I'd love to see it again where I'm not as sleepy. (laughs) Um, I think it'd be a good, like morning movie with a coffee or something. Um, so I didn't love it as much as I thought I would, but I would, I definitely check it out again. Okay. Now Clark's outrage about the sound of metal. I didn't realize he's the lead in that too. Yeah. Yeah. And sound of metal. He, yeah, is like a, like a punk drummer who that's basically like his life is like whole, like identity is like wrapped up in like you know, touring and stuff. And then he, um, yeah, becomes, becomes deaf because he he just plays loud music and doesn't uh, take care of his ears. He was also in Nightcrawler. One of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. Yeah. He's like the, uh, he's like the sidekick that Jake Gyllenhaal ends up with. He looks, I think, I guess much younger in that movie. I guess it's probably been years since that came out, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it was 2014. I told you, I got like, in, uh, he was also in four lions. Oh uh, yeah. Oh. You have to see. I know. I, you know, it, there's so it's much. It's guy who did brass eye. Yeah. But also the story of four lions is, um, I hear about the real one all the time, or at least, you know, when I was listening to that kind of garbage all the time, and by garbage, I mean, I mean, politics. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know, man. I am so gullible like to my DNA. That when I watch a movie, they're just the characters. I don't know the actor. I never think about it. Sure. And it really takes a lot for them to like stand out. And um, yeah. I'm kind of regretting looking into this while you were talking. But on IMDb, there is a picture of him in his uh, rap regalia. And I love that the all seeing eye over his pineal gland, that tattoo. <laughs> Has anybody ever actually done? I'm sure somebody must have done that before him, but that. That's fucking cool. Yeah, you should also uh, check out Riz's song "Post 9/11 Blues." Speaking of 9/11, um, it's satire and it's it's good. Yeah. Oh my god! Is it about Building Seven? It's about the whole thing, essentially, like coming from a uh, 
Yeah, it's kind of like saying that like after 9-11 that like now he's like uh he's got the blues because like they they did the thing, I guess. I don't know. I haven't listened to it in a while, but the first time I heard it was uh I don't know. It sounds it like good. it's on some edgy territory there and you just didn't it's want to edgy. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the the I could tell the minute you're like, it's satire. So everybody going into this on my recommendation, don't worry. Yeah. Tia Truther. Yeah, him and uh Marion Cotillard. Tight. What happened to your boy, Clark? They cut down his HBO special about 9-11 because he included Building 7. Spike Lee. Oh, Spike, man. yeah. Dude, what a... Man, what a trip. Like, you got to include it. Because, you know, people like me, I'm going to be like, how do you ignore something like that? Like, even if you're going to present that information and just kind of, like, debunk it or try to, you got to... It's an elephant now, and it's in the room. Well, Biden <laughs> is declassifying uh, the documents. Oh no! Really? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that what, what we're going to learn from that. He also had a word of the day light bulb. <laughs> He's like, "Oh, I got an idea." Come on, man! Come on! Come on! Right. Randy, it looks good. It looks like a movie I'll watch in two years and be like, "How did we not talk about this?" And I'll bring it to the table <laughs> and you'll be like, "Dude, two years Probably. ago." What, what were we just talking about? There was a movie I wanted to watch. I'm like, I don't know. This has Randy written all over it. It was The Wolf House. Yeah. Have you seen that, Randy? The Wolf House? Oh, is it like the uh, animated one? Yeah. 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 Not yeah, Wolf it Walkers. Wasn't, no, no, no. I think I've seen The Wolf House. Yeah. Yeah. Wolf Walkers is uh, stop motion. Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I'd have to, uh, I'd have to verify, but I feel like I've seen it. Yeah, you probably, I, Oksana instantly was like, I think Randy talked about that. I'm like, okay. Yeah, because I added it to my uh, watch list on Letterbox, which I don't think I've ever removed anything from. And I think he's the only one who rec who reviewed it. Yeah, I think this was a Chattanooga <laughs> film. All right. Good job, Randy. You really got the ear of the women on this show. <laughs> Ooh. I try. <laughs> what, what are you, Macy Gray? All right, pause the Saints game. It's it's your turn, Clark. Uh, it's over. We won thirty eight to three. I just oh, turned oh, the dude. TV off. <laughs> you did it, dude. We did it. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, the most anticipated film of all time, dude. <laughs> James Wan is back. Avatar oh, two. Oh my god. <laughs> He's back with. I'm just gonna power through that. Because Joe Rogan is not on the show. God, he loves him some Avatar. It's disgusting. It's fucking stupid. <laughs> it's so stupid. <laughs> Malignant. James Wan with an original story. He's coming back. He's out of the franchise game, at least for this one, until we see Malignant 2, which I don't know if we will. Yeah. Uh, if we do, I'm down. Because Malignant was bananas. And I loved it. Now, um, I had no expectations for this whatsoever. I'm a James Wan Same. fan. I just, I like, I like the James Wan scare. I like how he builds suspense. And frankly, you know, I'll say it. I like a James Wan jump scare. I think he does a good jump scare. Um, and I just like how he, he frames out his, um, you know, suspense in that way. Um, so I, I stylistically, I like what he does and, you know, I like the fact that he's, you know, Hollywood saw something in him and, you know, he's running with, uh, Aquaman. He's running with, he did a Fast and the Furious movie. Like, you know, guy's talented. He gets, he gets shit done, Russell Fisher. I agree. Shit done. So, uh, you know, now that, you know, they're saying that Malignant is no horror film, sign me up. Let's go. So we all went to the theater. Uh, we get to the theater at Tanferan. Oksana says that we are way early. We are 12 minutes early, which <laughs> and in this, in this universe, Randy, that's way early for them. We got there in plenty of time. And uh, now we got there in time. Uh, our movie partner got there. Uh, by the way, 
I love Terrell, but Terrell walked into that theater like Zsa Zsa Gabor. He had like, <laughs> he had like four shopping bags and then like he made a whole scene about he had to sit in the middle. So then I had to move. <laughs> Wait, you're, you're burying it too. He had a drink and he had like uh, aviators on. Yeah. He had it's, it's shit everywhere <laughs> all over his person. <laughs> and again, he had the aviators on. Um, I think again, it might be a self-inflicted wound, but I think he took a fingernail to the eye, which oh. I, I had done in middle school. It is incredibly painful. And on top of that, he had to get a fingernail to the eye. Rough sex. I don't know. I didn't ask. I think actually, I think he was just working and he did it to himself, but, uh, it got infected too. Oh, so he, he had an eyeball bubble. And I'm again, sorry, Trell, I'm sorry if you didn't want anybody to know this, I'm sorry. But, uh, bright lights fuck him up right now Man, dude i know oh, yeah. i get it i i had a uh, corneal abrasion uh my senior year of high school is that that's that's no joke like man. the lamest injury <laughs> it really was i had an abra- dude i got a basketball fingernail in the eye coming yeah. down off a rebound and uh dude it was brutal so uh, yeah. yeah i can only imagine what he's going through dude i just got uh grit got in my and gr- grit or sand or dirt just cut my eye so, oh, yeah. well, from what he told me, uh, he woke up the next day after having that little injury and he was leaking out of his eyeball. Oh, God. Yeah. He had pus forming and it was yeah, this rough. man. I Now, again, I met Terrell in a job interview and for the fucking decade plus I've known him. I don't think he's ever called into work a day because he's a maniac like that. And he called out for this. Or actually, I think he took yeah. a half day. Yeah, he left early. Yeah, okay. Also, you know, Terrell, uh, his Blu-ray Tuesday thing's up on YouTube, so if you haven't checked that out, go watch it, but you want to you wanna keep going through the theater rundown? That's pretty much it. You know, once once uh, Miss Gabor sat down yeah. <laughs> in her middle seat, um, you know, and after the uh, hour and a half of uh, coming attractions and oh, Coke commercials. God. We get to the movie. Now, I don't understand why y'all want to be there on time when you're greeted with 40 minutes of tr- commercials. Not even like trailers or anything. It's just... it's Okay. Oh. Two things. Two things. Number one is the experience. Okay. It's part of the deal. <laughs> it's just part of the deal. Number two, we went to Tanforan. You never know what you're yes. going to get at Tanforan because they may show the movie 15 minutes early. They yep. may show the movie with no previews. They may show the wrong movie. You don't know what you're going to get at Tanforan. <laughs> yeah, you forgot they may show the movie with the lights all on, too. Yeah. Are the wrong movie? They may re- they re- restart it 15 minutes. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> We've gone through the whole rigmarole with them. Now, only one time did they start the movie early, and I was angry because it was insane. No, and twice. They've done it twice. Oh, what was the other time? I can't think of it, but it was it was um, that that uh, Soderbergh cell phone movie was one. Yeah. What was that called? Insane. That's the one that like bothered yeah. me. Insane, and there was another one. Um, not oh, too insane. long ago. Insane. Yeah. Thank oh, you. It was not I'm- too long ago. It was. Uh, Oh, Sparks Brothers. Sparks Brothers started early. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there was another one. It's fine. And then underwater, they showed 1917. Four, uh, twice. Yeah. <laughs> it played for 15 minutes, turned on the lights, cut it, then played it again. And it was night With the lights on. And then fixed it, but left the lights on for all of uh, underwater. Yeah. It was so good. Were the, were the lights on the whole time for underwater? Yeah, they were on the whole time. That's that. All right, I'll say that's why I didn't like it. Also, if you're a fan of underwater, I know um, Shudder right now has a movie that Bill Spataro's been pushing. Uh, he's a big fan of Super Deep, which is a Russian blockbuster about drilling into the Antarctic or something. And I think it's a monster movie. I haven't watched it, but I probably will all next right. week. All right, so back to the movie. Now, uh, the reason why I was excited, to, I mean, again, I'm a James Wan fan. But I had did, I did a little bit of uh, research, and early reviews were saying, "Hey, this movie's this movie's strange. This is not what we thought it was, and that's that's all I need to know." Then I heard whispers of uh, Fulci and you know Hidden Lauder 
And I'm not necessarily fans of those guys, but I appreciate what they do. And if if we're talking about James Wan and, you know, if he's making a basket case type of movie, then OK, I'm I'm interested. Right. So that's why I definitely wanted to go to a theater to see that, um, even though, again, uh, Tan Fran and we're running the risk of them fucking it up. But they didn't. Everything worked out. Uh, movie opens up in, I believe, 1984, somewhere in there. And we're at a, um, a very, you know, um, how, how, would you, how would you describe that mental hospital that's sitting on a sea? You know, it's, it's on a cliff. It's very, um, I don't know, opaque. Is that the word I want to use? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think it is either. <laughs> I don't know. Well, kind of. It is a little foggy. I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's very, you know, I don't know, gothic to a certain extent. Um, so we get there and uh, there's some sort of shenanigans that are happening immediately. There's a patient there. And all we know is that people are dying in this hospital because of a violent situation. We see the outline of a creature, and that's all we know. And we know this creature controls electricity, and he's killing all the nurses in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Cut to modern day. We've got a wife. She's pregnant. She's married to an asshole. He throws her up against the wall, and her head cracks the wall. Welcome to Malignant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you can actually see, like, it almost looks like an alien. It That um, hospital felt very, like, sci-fi or, like, kind of, like, throwback 50s to me. Yeah. And I was a little worried. And then, we, you know, uh, also, shout out to Mike Mendez, uh, horror director, who played the security guard that gets wrecked in that opening scene. Oh, I didn't yeah. notice that. Yeah. Do you know him? Are you familiar with like big ass? I, 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 yeah, I am familiar, but I, I wouldn't know him if, you know, he was in this chat. Yeah, he's, he was he's in this very, chat and it said Mike Mendez. Yeah, he's very LA. Like there was that whole, um, there was like a group of like mid level horror directors who all hung out and he was like a part of it. And I'm, I'm sure he's friends with James Wan, who was also a part of that group originally. And then, you know, clearly his career is blown up. Yeah. But dude, when they jumped forward in time to the uh, drama, I was like, what are we in the 90s now? Like, I felt so alienated as an audience member trying to like figure out the like language or what we were doing with this film. It felt like timeless and new in a way, which to me instantly makes me worried. And I'm like, oh, this production, they don't know what they're doing. And I was kind of confused. And I'm like, oh, this movie's going to be a, a fucking shit show. That, did so, you get that vibe at all? So let's. Um, oh wait, hold I, on. I, I, How far are we going to go into this? Too? That's what I'm saying. I don't want to spoil it. Okay. Um, I, I I do think that we should walk on eggshells here. I feel uh, like it, everybody's seen it though. I kind of do that too. Can we? All right. If we go into it, we'll put it in the metadata. So we, we, okay. you want to spoil right, it? Let's just let it go naturally. I mean, normally you're the one that likes to jump right to the end and be like, bada bing, bada boom. <laughs> well, all right, we're spoiling it. Fuck okay. it. Here we go. <laughs> if you haven't seen Malignant, it, it's on HBO. Yeah, it's streaming. And if you don't have HBO, I get it. It's $15 a month. I actually just canceled mine recently. I'll be back <laughs> on next week. Okay, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... I'll tell you this, Russell, I didn't know where I really stood with this movie until the third act. Absolutely. Same here. Yep. Because when the third act comes, woo, fun ride. Um, not saying, uh, now again, um, so essentially, let's go back to the bedroom. We've got an abusive husband and, you know, now we, now he's talking about, we learn that she is pregnant again because she's had previous miscarriages. And so the husband uses that as, you know, fuel to the fire. Da -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. <laughs> no, you didn't. I actually, I got stuck imagining you doing a podcast. That's kind of like love line called back to the bedroom with Clark little. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> I know we'll get, we'll work on that. Is Dr. Drew on it. 
dude, the the whole birth thing, I think that was part of the problem I had in the first act. It, it felt like there was a lot of weird exposition coming out. And I'm like, is is that going to play in at any point? And I I think every word comes back around and it pays off. The thing is, I, it does. And I'll tell you, because the third act is so... You know, Gwen Stefani said it herself. It's B-A-N-A-N-A-S. And because the third act is so crazy, Ugh. I feel this easily deserves a rewatch. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I definitely need to do that soon because I already I was going back in the first two acts of like, OK, there. Yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, it was right in front of you the whole time, especially in this. All right. I want to stay on task. So the husband, he's a bad guy. He's sleeping on the couch because he knows he made a boo-boo. And frankly, the wife uh, locked him out of the bedroom. Well, there's a visitor that comes in the middle of the night that looks like Sting. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you know, uh, a, a, I don't know. A, 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 what what, what kind of outfit would you describe um, our antagonist to have? Kind of like a... Um, what kind of jackets would you call those? I don't know, he like kind of like look like duster, dark man to me, or yeah. like uh, in hardware. Did you ever watch hardware? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah, or the Undertaker, or the Undertaker. Yeah, good, good call. Like there. A, much smaller. Like a, yeah, it just you know stringy long hair that it covers uh, its face mm -hmm. and uh, kills this guy. Now I will say, the gore is great. The gore's great, and it's only a preview as to what's coming. And then the you know the wife is upset, obviously, because you know his her husband's uh, head is basically torn off. Um, <laughs> and you know then then there are more strings of murders that are happening um, that are closely associated to our uh, female lead. Uh, one of which where there's a woman in her attic and she falls out of the attic through the ceiling and then is immediately brought in for questioning um, where she then learns that the person causing all the problems um, is somehow related to her um, because she, she was adopted when she was eight years old and she didn't really know her life before she was eight. And she has to go visit her mom to find out some more information along with her sister, uh, who apparently is a princess at a theme park that was supposed to be a thing but <laughs> that, that didn't pay off. So now you're doing a good job of recreating exactly where I fell asleep. I did. I'll admit it. In the first act here, I fucking dozed off. And normally the roles are reversed and Oksana will fall asleep in the beginning. And she gets very angry when I poke or like push her a little bit. And I'm like staring at her with a, yeah, you were asleep look. Well, I was greeted to that during this movie. And I remember when I kind of came back being like, what did I miss? And why, why is this Disney thing important to the story? And I, I think that's really, she's just supposed to be the girl next door. Yeah. Yeah, because what happens to her later on is truly tragic. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you feel it. Yeah. So she then learns that um, she kind of had uh, an imaginary friend called Gabriel when she was young. And Gabriel caused some problems for her when she was very young. Uh, but Gabriel was soon out of the picture once her baby sister was there and she, you know according to the family and everyone involved they were just like yeah you just didn't need him anymore because yep. you had uh the little baby so she lived her life and then didn't even remember gabriel but now she's talking to gabriel uh on the phone again and he's like remember me yeah which uh totally now, when you, when you, okay, so I was a little bit on the wall with Malignant. I'm like, I want to watch it. We go and see every new horror movie. It didn't get a, th a Thursday release, which I thought was no, weird. weird. I think they actually held it back to open wide with the HBO release, which probably I was like, what? They never do that. Why are they doing that now? And I was kind of like, all right, I guess we'll watch it at home. But no, we ended up going on Friday and 
what got me excited was you mentioning the Hen and Lauder Fulci thing. And it took me a while post screening to be like, what was the Fulci influence? But the fucking telephone is so um, uh, the New York Ripper, which is, I mean, I almost got another goddamn cartoon tattoo inspired by the New York Ripper. I really wanted to do like a Donald Duck in a trench coat kind of thing. Have you ever seen the New York Ripper? No. All right. It's, um, you know, Jack the Ripper, but in New York. And uh, the only way people talk to him really is over the uh, rotary phone. And he sounds like Donald Duck. Oh. It's, it's fucking weird. It's bizarre, but it, it's good. And it, they're totally, dude, it's so weird for being set in Seattle and um, kind of like channeling that like gritty New York vibe. They fucking, James nailed it. Now, when we went up, we went up to uh, Seattle. I think I did a remote call on this show when I went up there for a dungeon synth festival. Now, while we were out there, we were doing the, the boring tourist thing. And we actually took a tour through that location where they shot in a uh, malignant underground. Yeah. Because that story's real where Seattle flooded and they just kind yeah. of abandoned that floor and they started building everything on top of it. So like literally in that movie, we, I think the tour starts there, which I thought was really weird that our character was leading tours through there, but Man, what a cool use of like that location. Also, just Seattle being like a rainy city, it's kind of a perfect like neo noir, neo giallo. Like, dude, this movie actually fucking hits everything. It's part Marvel movie, it's part slasher film, it's sci fi. Like, yeah, I don't know. I'm still kind of like felt, it felt her. it felt John Woo at some point. Yeah, dude. I, well, it actually that's why I was thinking like Sam Raimi and like Dark Man. Which, you know, it didn't really work. But, like, in this film, it fucking did. I was kind of blown away when the action started, how invested in it I was. Dude. Yeah, all right. So let's, let's speed up here. So, so now we know that there's something called Gabriel out there causing a ruckus. Hold on. Let's stop yeah. there, too. Because this movie, we're doing a Hitchcock thing where names mean things. Everything's got a double meaning everything you can like look into and extract something from what do you think the idea of naming uh the invisible friend or the imaginary friend gabriel was is that a bait and switch i don't know i just assumed it was some sort of biblical thing that i couldn't tie together because i forgot who gabriel is oh my god randy can you clue us in on who gabriel was i cannot either i don't know oh my god the angel gabriel wasn't he sent to earth to like protect people he was like earth a earth angel, earth angel. Why am I, I, you know, my, my mom is the one who said I should have made you go to church. <laughs> Yet yeah. you two who grew okay. up can't like. Yeah. Because we were made to go to church dude, <laughs> and we rebelled. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay. Well, I think Gabriel, I don't know. I, you know, I'll get, I'll come back to this later as you go on. So. Then what happens is that uh, our lead detective, um, who I liked, by the way, Kokoa Jones. What was his name? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't remember. I think it was something like Kokoa Jones. It was tight. I got to look it up because he was awesome. Oh, it was Kokoa Shaw. Kokoa Shaw. Kokoa Jones is better. But I don't know. Kokoa Shaw. Shaw is very Hong Kong. Like Cat 3, yeah. Shaw Brothers? Yep. Oh, there you go. There, it was there, right there. there. Ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was right there. Yeah. So uh, one of the Shaw brothers is involved in a chase with Gabriel. That chase was great because oh, now we tight. learned, yeah. oh, Gabriel's a parkour master. And <laughs> is Gabriel walking backwards? Is Gabriel uh, a backwards man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Like what the hell? Oh wait, you haven't seen that? There's a a meme going around oh. of the backwards man where they just removed uh Freddie got fingered and put malignant over That's it. So good. Oh, That's look, so dude, good. I oh, man, I should have sent it to you. That would have been a good moment. Uh but that chase scene happened um like in the in, started in the police precinct and they ended up in the Seattle underground. Great chase scene. Great chase scene. Now, well, hold on. Let me, let me stop you there because there's one thing that felt very narratively in a genre film. You can normally tell, like, okay, in like a Western or in like an action film, your protagonist is usually the one who can 
stick up for themselves and fight back. Yet in this movie, we have kind of like a, um, our protagonist is, she's fragile and feels very real, like a normal human. And then our detective is going blow for blow with this super villain. Did that catch anybody off guard? Like, I'm kind of like, whoa, like, who's this dude and how come he can stand up to the backwards man? He's a Shaw brother. I I know, but it was just, it's so like when you're building a world in um, a fiction narrative, there's like different tiers people are on. And, you know, usually the more important of the story, the more capable. And this dude was kind of, he, he had secondary character written all over him. But then we get that, dude, we get that. And it's like, oh, is the movie about to jump into like his perspective? Well, Kakoa Jones, Kakoa Shaw's got a lot of things going on. <laughs> Kakoa he's, Jones, over here. he's he's a handsome he's a handsome fella. Um, he's one of the little forensics chicks uh, is all over him. She wants to bone him. He does. He has no interest. But she was cute. I don't know, She's great. Doing? Now, also, now let's talk about the one thing that I did not like in this movie. And mm. frankly, it may be of why this movie is a four and a half and not a oh five. Oh my god! All right. And that is because a cheap ass Wanda Sykes that they get <laughs> that K- Kakoa Shaw's partner, who is a. You remember a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the fly. Yeah. OK, she is she is the Brundle fly of. Oh, my God. Of Wanda Sykes. <laughs> if Wanda Sykes went in Jeff Goldblum's <laughs> little transporter machine. It would have come out as this woman. No, why? I'm like, not quite as good as Wanda Sykes. So would you have rather they just had Wanda Sykes or did you yeah. have a problem? Okay. Well, I'm sure, but I'm sure they couldn't afford her because they had to pay for that chase scene. Dude, there's a lot of money in this movie. Dude, I think James I Wan could have done whatever he wanted. I have no idea what the budget was, but that's why I love this movie is because this movie is insane. Yeah. And they put money in it because like the dudes like gold. They're like, yeah, do what you want to do. And he did. Make a, it's man. All right. So <sighs> we get to a point to where the sister's like, all right, I need to know what's going on because I'm trying to protect my sister because now they put her in jail. They think my sister's out killing people. So I got to, I got to protect my sister. So she goes to the mental institution um, now, we should also say at this point, Gabriel has killed um, every all the people involved with. Um, Spoiler. What's our, dude. what's our protagonist's <laughs> name? What's her name? Uh, Madison Michelle. Yeah, Madison. So, again, she was adopted. So all the doctors involved in her treatment um, as a child uh, have been killed. And also we learned that Madison's birth mother have all, has also been kidnapped and was actually being held hostage in Madison's attic. And that was the person who actually fell through the ceiling. But Madison didn't know. So the sister goes to the abandoned hospital and pulls up documents and tapes of Madison being there. And uh, they get the VHS tape. They pop it in. And once they pop it in, welcome to Act 3. Yeah, because that is where everything takes a turn. So, again, as we've talked about it, we're going to spoil this. So if you have not seen Malignant, please skip ahead. Um, Randy, can we try to do like a, a little time stamp if we can? Yeah, yeah I can do All right, that. let's try to do that. Let's try because I, 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 you know, if you I don't want to spoil it if you haven't seen it. Um, All right. Well, you did mention that the killer was named Gabriel a little bit ago. So anybody who's paying attention might. uh Two plus two that moment. Yeah, but see, that's the thing. It's like we knew that before, but you then did. it wasn't. Yeah, not, I, we, I guess. No, that's fair. Yeah. So we get we get in the we, she pops in the tape and uh, we see a, a eight, seven, eight year old Madison there. She's very sad. She's like, I want this to stop. <laughs> and they're like, OK, we got to we got to get rid of. Uh, we got to get rid of the cancer. So the camera turns to the other side of Madison and there is a creature that is coming out of the backside of Madison. And, um, it is basically a parasite. Of course they said it is an extreme version of, a something, something, a tumor, I believe it's yeah, it's a, 
it's, it's a, not a tumor. Para, it's it's a puma. It's a parasitic <laughs> tumor. Can you describe what uh, Gabriel looks like for the listeners? I'd love to hear your breakdown. One of my uh, third girlfriend. I'm not laughing at that. She was a nice lady and they never found the body. (laughs) No, she wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) No, you know what he looked like? It's like, um, remember in Independence Day, the little alien that was piloting the big alien? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the vibe I got. Like a little scrawny, like, I don't need muscles to do anything like that. Yeah, honestly, if they would have just left him in there, it probably would have been better. It looked good. Dude, it looked revolting. Yeah. And also, you know, if we're going to get back to the hen and lauder, like homage, I mean, everybody goes for like the, for the Siamese twin, you can hide like Quado or like, uh, well, what the hell did I, what's another, or in like sleepaway camp, eh, that one got operated out early, but this one, I don't know why I'd never thought about like a hard reverse Siamese twin. Yeah. I don't, it's and one it, of those ideas where it's like, you know, I, I fully believe that there are no original stories, but man, if you're doing visual storytelling, this one felt fucking original. Yeah. Like, it is not derivative from anything. Also, there's arms and like, there's like a chest. It's like a, a being growing out of her. Well, also, you know, uh, to go back to the, her finding the footage, if you remember in Hereditary, that was a moment that the director hated. And he was like, you know, there's the, ex- the exposition you have to do for the audience. And he talked about how he hated that moment where uh, they find the like shoebox full of information and are going through and learning the, the you know, the hereditary story, like the the heritage of the witch cult or whatever. And in this movie... I was like, okay, we're doing the exposition thing, but the way that James Wan does it, it's completely interesting. And instead of flipping through files, we get a found footage style VHS tape and we lean into it because we get a full VHS treatment of a bone saw cutting out a Siamese twin from a skull down to like the bottom of your spine. Dude, it was, it was gnarly looking. So the way that they, uh, again, thank you to uh, beautifully laid exposition. Uh, they explained that they could not get rid of the entire uh, parasite uh, because it would risk the life of Madison. Therefore, they left just a teeny tiny part <laughs> inside her brain. And um, so then and then again, as we talked about before and this very long review of Malignant, I do apologize. Um, oh, I'll give you shit for it later. I was already waiting. This is mainly your fault. Nah. <laughs> Don't put it on me. It can't always be my fault. Also, I, dude, the best part about like cutting the twin apart was, you know, we had to leave a little bit. And in the truest form to human centipede two, you start to question who these Kevorkians are as yeah. they just literally push her brain back in the skull and kind of close it up and like staple it shut. <laughs> Dude, it felt like wrong and violating and completely revolting. Yeah. Yeah. A child. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then and then later we learned that, you know, Gabriel was dormant because, as we said, she didn't need Gabriel once uh, the baby sister was born. So uh, throughout the movie, Gabriel's his uh, the crown jewel was going to be killing the sister, um, who is why Gabriel was, you know, not in out in the world causing havoc. Uh, but when Madison hit the wall from her husband, uh, the back of her head hit the wall, and apparently that awoke Gabriel from his long slumber and started this whole killing spree. And then we see all of this come to fruition in what I'm going to call my favorite scene of the year thus far. And that takes place in a holding cell in a, wiz- in a women's jail where uh, Gabriel is awoken from this young lady after she gets the shit beat out of her in what I'm going to call the strangest collection of women ever assembled in a holding cell ever. Uh, There is a... um, uh, 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 I don't know. A a trucker-like 
Uh, no, no, no. Okay. Uh, it's, Foxy Cleopatra. <laughs> it's Cleopatra teams up with Joe Dirt's mom. Yeah. He's rocking a mullet and like some denim tuxedo. So they start pushing her around and then they start like curb stomping her and they <laughs> kick her. And then here comes Gabriel and incredible. <laughs> that monthly crew in jail is like the suburban nightmare where it's like i'm not supposed to be here i'm not cut out i'm, I'm not one of these people and you look around and it's like they're all thugs and thieves but like there's some unspoken law that they all agree to which says anytime a square ends up in jail we all just team up and terrorize them it almost felt like a dreamscape like, I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, the village people are in here and they're all beating her up for no yeah. reason. Dude, I mean, the, but how good was that action scene, though? No, it was amazing. And it was gory, which I was a little worried uh, when we were going to talk about this on the podcast, because I've been talking about it nonstop with people since we watched it. And, you know, when you kind of blow your load like that, it's like, uh, I got nothing left. The thing that never came up, I never talk about the gore. And it, it's, I think it's a testament to how good the movie is Yeah. when the brutal and beautiful gore in this film is like not even, it's not even making it into the conversation. It's brutal. Also, they, they, we were playing with the slasher trope here too. And one of the, my favorite things about a slasher is the origin story and the weapon they use. Now the weapon is a stripped down trophy that turns into like a gladiators, like Cestus kind of thing. And man, I fucking loved it. As somebody who spent a lot of time with his friends, like trying to like slasher battle, like, Oh, what would your slasher be? Come up with the background and then a unique weapon. I feel like James Wan not only killed that, he crushed like the shallow genre. He crushed like dark gritty nineties crime and like superhero film. Like this movie is a, they he threw all the genres in a blender and came out with something that it, like elevated all of it. It's fucking, it's strange, man. Yeah. Also now, now that we uh, have revealed also, that, severe body count. Oh dude. Yeah. Everybody dies in there Incredible and it's kind of body count. It's refreshing. We don't get enough of that in horror. Now uh, I want to take a moment and I want to get a little highbrow injection in this show. Oh, now, and was, by the way, when I say body count, Randy, I'm not talking about your favorite band. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the nice clarification. Tea? Fuck yeah. Now, Jungian theory is a thing that I always pretend to understand what I'm talking about. But in this film, it was so striking. Again, I always call back to Cinematic Oblivion. That's our buddy Nick and Harry Nordlinger. Uh, they're currently not recording any new episodes, but you can still find it. They October Voice. They, yeah, exactly. They did a three part series on slashers where they kind of talk about like the Jungian theory behind it. And I pulled up a brief description because now listen to how spot on this unspoken like theme in the film. It, it just it's so natural that you're like, dude, James Wan, it, he's just a, a genius. So here's here's the anima and animus uh, explained in like two sentences. The anima and the animus are described in Carl Jung's school of analytical psychology as part of this theory of collective unconsciousness. Jung described the anima as the unconscious masculine side of a woman and the anima as the, the anima as the unconscious feminine side of a man. Now, what's so interesting about that is that her brother, Gabriel, you know, is named after an angel who is a protector. And it, it's this kind of deep, the theme of uh, like the uh, the the inner strength of a woman because it is they even mention it in this movie it's her body the whole time yeah like all of the shit that's happening all of the the acrobatics the fighting the next level violence it's her but it's this unconscious unspoken um side of her that she didn't even know she had until her husband smashed her head against the wall and i mean it's truly a master of horror who can have something that deep and meaningful in a movie and never call attention to it. Like if you want to come back and think about it a little bit, it's there. I mean, you can draw these parallels through everything. Even again, I know some of you are going to roll your eyes, but the use of mirrors in this movie and duality, dude, James Wan fucking master. I love him. All right. 
The Carl Young stuff is done. I liked it. Five stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, we there's so much more to this film. Um, one thing here, let's talk about the beginning of the movie again. The house, did it feel off to you at all? It felt, as, as Oksana said, uh, comically large. It comically felt large. It felt like a labyrinth to a certain extent. Deteriorating and super dirty all over the place. Well, it felt like well, that's just that's just the Seattle real estate market. <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? Damn! If I had a rim <laughs> shot on this soundboard, I would have played it for you right there. Here's the thing: the cavernous, like the house, felt huge. It felt remote. Like the, it didn't feel like there were neighbors around, even though they mentioned there were. But it also felt like designed poorly like there weren't enough rooms in the house we had a large attic we had a giant downstairs we had a kitchen and then the like second floor was just kind of like a big bedroom and i've been thinking about him like dude james wan he's such a master of like you know using the camera and revealing mise-en-scene and making shit feel claustrophobic or and i'm like why did he why did the house feel this way my theory now is that it's supposed to be a dollhouse it's kind of mm. like what a little girl would play with where the rooms are oddly shaped. There's like a weird lack of bathroom. There's uh, everything's just giant. And on the main floor, the ceiling felt like it was 40 feet in the air. And I'm like, well, what would that do? And to bring it to the one thing I didn't like about this movie, we mentioned that uh, the activation of Gabriel kind of, he, he had a power over her to make her feel like sedated or kind of, to give her a faux reality, like everything was fine while he took over her body. And I was like, dude, I think it's just a metaphor for being in a dream state. Like the whole house is kind of a prison, but it's also like a faux reality. I, it, it felt like if you would have told me in the first act of this movie that I could walk away from it and still be thinking about it and coming to new conclusions, I would have, I don't know, I would have called you a liar. There's so much here, though. It's great. Randy, what, how do you feel about it? Tonally, it was weird for me until the third act. So I didn't love it, but I did kind of like the, uh, I don't know, some of the like creepy house stuff. Um, I don't know. I thought like the exterior of the house looked really cool. And there was like, I don't know, fog, like when it's done well in movies, always, I always appreciate. And I felt like it just had this like pretty creepy vibe. But then, uh, yeah, yeah, it was like part okay. detective movie. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, so I it, totally it felt kind of jumbled to me, and I couldn't really get what it was doing. But then, yeah, once we uh, get to the third act, I was, I was in. I th I think most people had that reaction, and yeah. that's what I've been telling people. I'm like, hey, you know what? Buckle up. The first act and most of the second act are going to be a little like, what am I doing here? And I'm like, yeah. it will all click in in the third though. And are are we pretty much we're, we're done with malignant? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we've talked for 45 minutes. So. All right, well, I'm going to pivot out um, on the idea that Randy just was articulating where as an audience member, you're kind of like, what are we doing here? Like, tonally, it's weird. It's really hard to get footing. And, you know, after living with Malignant, I think that's just the mark of a movie that doesn't wear its influences on its sleeve. Like with Tarantino, we always know what we're doing and you get it right away. And I don't mean this in like a negative way. But I think we're pivoting away from that now and we're coming into a do your thing, which is really embodying like digital camera, um, a lot quicker jump cut kind of like pace. It's we're we're kind of getting away from the 70s film era and we're we're ish, we're coming into a new right now. It's pretty confusing kind of modern cinema thing. And Malignant is definitely that. And when we left and we came home, I was, I was wrapping my head around this and uh, Clark went to bed, Terrell and Oksana, uh, we, we all hung out and we ended up, we jumped into another movie, uh, Death Drop Gorgeous. Now this is a drag queen horror movie. If you're like me, I've seen what both of uh, Bianca Del Rio's films. And again, I'm going to talk shit on drag queen movies, exclude all the John Waters stuff from this. Those are different. I think what drag queens meant to the culture were different than too. It was kind of like an edgy uh, confronting space where now RuPaul is everywhere on the planet and it's mostly universal, ex universally accepted. And now, man, I mean, 
fucking drag queens, I think they've become a different type of thing when you're on that level. And the films all fucking suck. I don't, I love Bianca and I watched her second movie and I thought it was okay, but I watched Willem. She was in a film, uh, the what? Dead don't die in Dallas, which was so boring. Yeah. But it was an indie horror film, which is more in our alley. And again, it d- didn't work for me. And then we're, it's like death drop gorgeous. I get it. Drop dead gorgeous. It's play on words. Went into this movie and, uh, I'm going to tell you, it's right there with Malignant for me. Like, clearly this is a micro-budget film, but just the treatment of cinema, it's completely modern. In this movie, uh, we're we're on their terms. Like, I hate it when a movie tries to, like, placate to me or just kind of like, hey, I'm going to usher you in. Like, I felt like Moonlight kind of did that with, like, gay culture. I'm not going to get deeply into that right now. But in this film, in Drop, in Death Drop Gorgeous, everybody in this world is pretty much gay. And I mean, everybody, the police, uh, the bar owner, even people who are clearly hey, it's about time. No, but I mean, hey, man, I'm coming to your fantasy. Like, let's let's play. And which is what I felt with Malignant. Like that was a James Wan movie through and through because nobody else knew what the fuck was going on. And in here we've got everybody's gay. We're using uh, I had to ask Terrell what uh, what was it? PNP meant. Yeah. And uh, again, you'll get it if you get it. Um, also in this film. Drag penis queen. and penis. No. <laughs> uh, but good guess. In this movie, drag queens shop in the day and uh, are in full drag. <laughs> it's just like we're, we're in their world. And we open up with a dude hooking up with somebody on an app. And they meet in an alley. And he is quickly dispatched in the most shallow, Christine oh. type way. And for a no budget movie... Dude, it didn't cut any corners. It looked beautiful. And I was just like, wow. Like, hey, I'm, I'm engaged right now. And I, th- again, this is coming off of Malignant. So like, I'm like, oh, whatever we watch is going to be doomed. Yet this film, it unfolds and we're, we're doing the same thing. Y- you know, you get deeper into it and you can see all of the influences, but they're not like, they're not out there. Like, it's not... Um, it's not being paraded like a Tarantino film. And I'll tell you one thing that I think you guys would appreciate. There's a douchebag they meet in a club and they met him on the app and uh, they're, they're talking Why is to it like, Tarantino with you, dude. Well, just Tarantino is a good example of somebody who like, when you jump into kill bill, you know what he's signaling here. You know what I mean? Like it's very clear what genre we're playing in where with malignant, you're like, wh-? like I was so confused. I'm like, what are we doing? A nineties soap opera where in this film, it's kind of like, it felt like fresh territory because I've never seen a um, knife plus heart was a very gay movie that wasn't scared of it. And I, you know, I talk about this even with fucking RuPaul's Drag Race, where they start eliminating the pit crew and shit. And it's clearly like, oh, we're going to try and broaden our audience. It's like, I don't want that shit. Make the movie you want to make and I'll show up. And dude, uh, Death Drop did that. And There's a moment in the film where, uh, again, they meet a douchebag on an app and they're talking to him and this guy's clearly not into the two. Now our lead is a, uh, how would you describe him? Kind of like a stocky, he's got, um, gauges in his ear, like a black gay dude. And his roommate is a tall, skinny, very effeminate gay dude. And, uh, this douche after not talking for like five minutes turns him and like, Hey, I don't like dark. What do you say? I don't like black guys and I don't like effeminate guys. And then he bounced and our, Terrell was there. And again, sorry, Terrell, that we're speaking for you, but he's just like, dude, that's a problem. Like if you're a black dude or effeminate guys will just, they'll be like that to you and just be like, Nope, sorry, not interested. And you know, I, it's, it's a lot of shit I didn't know, but I'm learning from watching this film. Anyway, that guy gets murdered, washes up on the shore and you, you could tell if you're a fan that they're, I'm like, are they going to Laura Palmer, this dude? And they do. And you get one shot where he's completely white. He's wrapped up in plastic and they gave him a glamour shot. And I'm like, if you're going to make a fucking movie that's like LGBTQ and you, you want like my respect, this is what you do. Make the movie like, you know, call back to the movies you love, play in the genre you love, but make it your movie. And dude, there's one huge problem with this film and uh, you'll, you'll both get it. It's like 45 minutes too long. 
It's almost two hours long. It's almost two fucking hours long. A and micro budget? Dude, man. And the thing is, it's a lot of dialogue. It's a lot of dialogue in the middle at that just it's the fucking death roll for a movie. And I'm telling you, I love a uh, dude. I want to pr- praise this movie. I'll even go as far to say, like, I love what they did. I'm just I'm ready for the next one from the director because, man, the runtime was brutal. We were all down there completely invested, struggling to be awake by the end of it. And I felt bad. But I also was like. When this movie started, I was. It looks like shot on video, almost like very grainy. It's very grainy, yeah. And I loved it because you don't see that usually in like movies starring drag queens. It's it's very like you know polished looking. Yeah, well, the drag queen has become kind of like just a star now. So when you get like a Bianca movie, the movie's about her, and she gets all the good lines, and everybody else is kind of at the beck and call. And you know, in her second movie, it's a little bit better, but. This film, Lead, was not a drag queen. There are several drag queens in it. We hang out in a bar. We do, we're doing bits with the police. Dude, so good. Too long. But, man, I... Uh, fuck, I didn't even want to spend all that time on this movie. Was it funny? You know, when it, when it was... Was it funny? I don't know. I would say it was a horror comedy. Yeah. Yeah, so when it was funny, it was. But it's not like it's not a comedy first movie. Actually, I don't know. It might be. You know, that's just a testament to what it was. Anyway, so it's more Dead Don't Die, not Shaun of the Dead. Oh, um, Dead Don't Die wasn't funny. I at know. All, I'm, I'm struggling with that comparison just because of that fucking movie. <laughs> you know, the thing is, this is a little bit Hen and Lauder, too, because it's a small urban center and we kind of like run all around it. I don't know. It's unique. It's modern. And that's why I wanted to like pivot into that out of Malignant. Anyway, I know, God damn it. You know, I cut the TBR report this week, partially so we wouldn't run long. Anyway, I'm going to shoehorn in one more movie. Malignant fucked us. Malignant fucked us, I know. Um, James Wan, it's your fault. I watched another film after Clark uh, last week talked about Inside. And uh, I started looking up our boy, uh, Alexander, what, Bastilio? Alexandra Bastilio, I think, who uh, co-directed the film with Julian Mary. Maury? I can't remember. Anyway, those two, they've been making movies since Inside. So I'm like, maybe I should check one out. Uh, the newest film that's available in America is called Candisha, which I tried to hail Mary Randy before the beginning of this episode. Randy, are you, are you going to watch it? Probably, yeah. I can't remember. Uh, I listened to some podcast that talked about it like weeks ago, and then I like bookmarked it in my brain and then immediately forgot about the title till you mentioned it today. Okay. You know what? I'm just going to tease it because I really want to talk to you about it. Um, the synopsis I'll give you for the film is it's Lahane with a all girl cast and, um, and mixed with Candyman. So it's okay. French projects, female cast of a uh, graffiti artist and it's Candyman, and, uh, cool. it's gory. Much And again, I had to write in big on my notes, gore, because with Malignant, I kept forget, forgetting to mention that, but people like it. So Candisha, it's K-A-N-D-I-S-H-A. Um, every, go watch it, and then we'll, we'll come back next week and it's, talk about it. It's on Shudder. Yeah, it's on Shudder, too. Sweet. Is your mic off? Because I see you talking, Clark. And- yeah, my bad. Okay. Well, y'all- <laughs> Y'all do that, uh, and then go see Inside, baby. Okay, well, why don't you watch Candisha, too? Because I don't have Shutter Access over here, dude. Oh, my fucking God. What? Is it the off week? You unsubscribed? No, I'm in Arizona. I can't bring my Apple TV here. Why not? Because I can't get the Apple TV to talk to the internet. Oh my God. I feel like that's an easy fix, right? It's there. not. It's not, bitch. You try. <laughs> you come down here. All right. Fly me out. I'll be your IT guy. I'll do it. If I fly you out here, I'm flying you down here to assist in my suicide. Oh, okay. well, what would I be doing? Clean up. Time- oh, that would be shitty. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I need your help. Dude, there's a movie for you. It's kind of like the triangle where you get a postcard from a friend you haven't seen in a long time. And yeah. It's like, hey, man, I really need your help. Uh, come down, bring a bucket. 
And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> and you come out there and it's just you're hanging in a hotel room. Try and it. there's there's a there's a mini DV on the bed. Oh. Well, don't don't bust your load, dude. I'm this is <laughs> a good idea. <laughs> All right. Uh I mean, yeah, I I figured we were going to go long on Malignant. I think uh, we all enjoyed it, and I think it's a good, uh, you know, it's uh, prescient uh, to the times. And uh, look, I love it. Oh, you go out there. People are not digging it. I'm not seeing it. In my, I'm seeing my it. My internet bubble. It. Yeah, everybody loves it, dude. I was talking to Amanda about it. She said uh, she was about to go watch it today, but all she had heard was negative. I'm like, but she did say, but those people, I don't really trust their opinion. So, so she was talking to you about it. Oh. Yeah. That's 74% on Rotten Tomatoes. And audience yeah. score 50. Yeah. I'm telling you the <laughs> audience, they're not digging it, man. I, you know, honestly, I think this is the downfall of having your shit open up on HBO because yeah. if I was at home, now, I don't turn off movies. If Clark was at home watching this thing and not feeling it halfway through the film, what are the odds that you just turn it off or you go cook ramen noodles in the for other sure. room? For sure. Yeah. For sure. And that's the thing, dude, like it takes its time, dude. Go yeah. see this in a theater. Now, Randy, uh, give us the highbrow reason why you hated it. I didn't hate it. I just <laughs> totally I wasn't on board with what was happening until the last 30 minutes. I gave it like a three and a half Man, on Letterboxd. Yeah, I, I wish I could have saw it with Randy. But how fun was that third act, Randy? It's great. <laughs> that's, that's a five star. That's, that's as excited as you will ever hear him. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else before we wrap it up and ship it out and zip it up and shut her down? Um, no, I don't know. I, you know, I, I bet there's a bunch of shit. I don't have those notes with me. So, you know what? Shout out to our buddy, Robbie. Uh, I forgot to mention this like a month ago, but when we were in Vegas, we helped him with a, some weird like zoom thing where he could get funding for a movie. And I believe in our drunken stupor of, uh, cheering and having a bunch of people over, we all jumped in there and voted for him. I think he won 25 grand for a film. Whoa. So Robbie. We uh, we better get a Clark Little role in this movie. Hey, Robin, let me hold a dollar. Yeah, he'll do nudity. I, you shot him in the shower before, so. Yeah, Again, Robbie my, Smith, pick him out. Look, Robbie's seen my weird butt. You know what I mean? I Robbie's, saw it too. Robbie's seen my weird it. dick. Robbie's seen my weird butt. Robbie gets it. Actually, I think Robbie's in a new band too, band, uh, Bone Splitter. So go yeah. check that out if you like extreme music like Randy. <laughs> Extreme music. Randy doesn't even call it music. He calls it noise. With a Z. <laughs> the Noisy Boys. That's his new noisy, podcast. The Noisy Boys. <laughs> I like the Noisy Boys. Write that down. Fuck All right, it. Randy, take her home. Yeah, next week I'm gonna watch Candisha. Russell's gonna watch Inside, and I'm also gonna watch uh Inside Lewin Davis for the like 20th time. So what what am well, I not gonna am I not gonna watch anything jerk off? Probably a football game. All right, that's fair. We'll see you next <laughs> week. True.